Hello, I'm Yun Sun Lei. I'm a graduate student at the Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Today, I will present our work on exploring phone-based authentication vulnerabilities in single sign-on systems. So multi-factor authentication is being increasingly used in a variety of scenarios, such as banking and financing applications. So many institutions have also started to migrate and train their employees to use multi-factor authentication. It is claimed to effectively mitigate the account compromise risk and block unauthorized use of credentials. So in contrast to traditional authentication, where a user is only required to provide a password and username, multi-factor authentication requires the users to provide an additional factor. So a factor in authentication is essentially a way of confirming the identity when a user tries to sign into a system. So generally, a factor could be something the user knows, such as a password. It could be something that the user processes, such as a smartphone or hardware key, or it could be something that the user is, such as a fingerprint or facial recognition. So phone-based authentication is a uh, proof of possession authentication factor in multi-factor authentication. Normally, a user with phone-based authentication will submit a one-time code that is received on their phone or interact with an app in order to complete the authentication process. In many organizations such as university, phone-based multi-factor authentication is commonly paired with single sign-on systems. The single sign-on systems allows users to sign in with a single user ID to multiple organizational services, while the phone-based authentication system allows the user to be authenticated through a multi-factor fashion. So this combination helps minimize the account management cost and protect users' accounts at the same time. Now, ideally, with a single sign-on system, users would not need to re-enter the credentials every time when they want to access the application. But improper configured single sign-on system can lead to the frequent authentication request. Previous works in usable security have shown that repetitive warnings and confirmation desensitize users to the importance of security decisions. So in such cases, a user might regard multi-factor authentication as extra steps that they need to click through in order to log in. This defeats the purpose of phone-based multi-factor authentication and may enable adversary to deceive the user into risky behaviors. So this brings us to our research questions. In this work, we try to answer to what extent can the adversaries deceive and the users into authorizing malicious behavior through phone-based mechanisms? And what phone-based authentication mechanisms have a greater risk and what symptoms result? So to answer these questions, let's first look at what is the normal process of single sign-on with phone-based authentication? It starts with user logging in with their credentials. As part of the single sign-on process, the application's website, which is the content prov provider shown in the figure, will redirect users to the identity provider's website, where the actual authentication happens. So this part is largely the same as a single factor authentication. The phone-based authentication that requires the additional factor happens after the user's credential has been validated. So as shown in step six, the identity provider prompts a phone-based authentication challenge to the user. Only when the user completes the challenge the identity provider will issue the authorized token. 
So a form-based authentication challenge is typically a task with specific instructions that can be completed only through or with the user's form. So for instance, the challenge might ask the user to input a one-time code that is only transmitted to the user's phone or ask the user to approve the login using an authenticator application. So the response to the challenge can either be sent through the browser or through the user's phone. These phone-based authentication systems make two key assumptions. First, the nouns will not be revealed to an adversary. And the, the legitimate user will only respond to the challenge of their own authentication attempts. However, if either assumptions is violated, the phone-based authentication system will fail to achieve its authentication go goals. Next, I will show two attacks that violate the above assumption. In the first attack scenario, we call the malicious relying party site. This scenario is consistent with a phishing attack in which an adversary successfully lures a user into a website that impersonates a legitimate website. As shown in the figure, the adversary interacts with the user as a malicious single sign-on relying party. The adversary will pretend to redirect the victim to the identity provider, but does not do so. If the user does not notice the deception, then the adversary will receive all data users submitted through their browser. So consequently, the adversary can covertly initiate a login session with the authentic relying party and identity provider. The user who may incorrectly believe that they are in the middle of a valid authentication attempt may follow the instructions to respond to the challenge. The demonstrate in this figure is only one example where the phone based authentication use one time code. In this specific case, the adversary not only receives the user's credential, but also receives a loss value. Such an attack applies to phone based authentications that use authentication apps as well. Since the adversary only needs to replace the uh, challenge instruction to the victim and wait for the victim to authorize uh, the adversary's authentication attempt. So from the user's perspective, the first symptom of such an attack is the incorrect URLs associated with the malicious site. Another symptom is a lack of redirection from the content website to the real identity provider. Only after the adversary succeeds in logging will the victim notice more obvious symptoms such as timeout if the attacker drops the user session or extra redirection to the legitimate relying party. So this attack violates both security assumptions based on what type of phone-based uh, authentication is used. The second attack scenario we call a timing attack on, on associated phone-based authentication approval. The key idea behind the timing attack is that some authentication options lack an association between the browser's login session and the phone's prompt. So for example, in an authenticator app receives a request asking users to approve the login. So if the request comes in without further context, the user cannot tell uh, which authentication will be approved if there happens to be multiple simultaneous authentications. So this ambiguity gives adversary chances to force user into authenticating an adversary's login session. 
an adversary for an adversary to be most effective in succeeding such an attack. This scenario assumes an on-path adversary who is capable of delaying and dropping packets between the user's device and the single sign-on identity provider. However, the adversary cannot decrypt packets between the two parties. So to effectively deceive the user, the adversary must know from the user's network traffic at which stage the user is in the single sign-on process. This allows the adversary to precisely delay delivering the user's login packet while having a separate login session at the exact same time. These steps are shown in the step five and six in this figure. So in order to queue and delay user's login packet, the adversary must learn the traffic pattern of the single sign-on protocol. So normally, these protocols involve specific DNS requests and redirection between the relying party and the identity provider. This allows an adversary to build transition maps that track the different stage of the protocol. In our own attack implementation, we control the kernel packet queue of a uh, router machine. We use packet analysis library to extract header information to track cumulative byte transmitted. We enqueue all packets on the protocol until the protocol reach the password submission step, and then we initiate the adversary's login. From the user's perspective, the symptoms of this attack are more subtle than the previous case because the packet delay can be falsely attributed to the network issues. The browser will appear as if it's loading while the phone will receive a signing approval request. Also, because the approval request arrives at the expected time of user's login, the user may approve it. However, in doing so, the user authorizes the adversary's authentication attempt. Another notable attack symptom is receiving a second authentication prompt if the adversary chooses to deliver the queued packet. In our daily use cases, we occasionally receive multiple prompt in a single authentication and must retry to log in successfully. So therefore, such a symptom might not raise any suspicion. This attack violates the PBA assumption that the legitimate user will only respond to the challenge of their own authentication attempts. Now with these attacks introduced, we explore whether users will notice the attack and whether the symptoms raise any concerns. To do so, we conduct a user study. We use our organization's institutional review board to ensure appropriate protection for our human subject. The main concern in our study is the use of disguise and ambiguity. Reviewing the focus of the study will bias our Result since participants would know in advance that we are monitoring their security decisions. Therefore, in our informed consent process, we indicate that our study would explore how website design affects the user experience, and that study would measure how various uh, design choices affect how easily and quickly a user notice that information being presented to them. So to conduct the user study, we set up the private experiment network as shown in the figure. In the malicious site scenario, the malicious website is hosted in the adversary machine. The router machine is blind in the malicious site case, but is considered attacker controlled in the timing attack scenario. We further use a dedicated test account to avoid any privacy concern. 
Such arrangements and setup allow us to safely perform the experiment without jeopardizing the identity provider and our organization's network. For this work, we recruited 13 participants in total who are computer science undergraduates in our organization. So for each participant, we asked them to log in into a puzzle website with a researcher provided account. At this stage, one researcher handles the attack step in the background. We end the process if the participant express any security concerns. After logging, we ask the participant to complete several puzzle games and provide feedback about the website design. We end the session with an interview where we review the true intention of the study and handle any questions from the participants. So for our 13 participants, we put them into groups and set up different attack scenarios. So let's first look at the results of the malicious site attack. One participant noticed an inconsistency in the animation on our fake signing page before entering the credentials. Therefore, we ended the study session. In our interview, this participant indicated that they had previously been the victim of an attack. So this might explain their cautiousness when in such situation. In case of uh, where the authentication use an SMS code, one participant did not notice the attack during the login process, but described the attack symptom during the interview. With app-based authentication, one participant noticed the operating system mismatch on the authentication request prompt. For the timing attack case, as we described in previous slide, it only works for push button based authentication request. We provide three variants for this case in order to explore whether additional attacks uh, help the user detect the attack. In the case without context, we provide only a proof and deny button. In the distance case, we provide an authentication prompt with intentional false location information. And finally, in the screenshot case, we provide the participants with a screenshot that does not match what they are performing on the experiment device. The result of the timing attack is uh, a little different than we expected. We started the experiment with the belief that additional context about the user's login session is helpful in detecting the attack. In the no context case, no participant noticed the attack because the uh, attack symptoms was very subtle. One of the participants reported that receiving a second notification is pretty standard for the anonymous uh, identity provider. What surprises us is participants fail to notice inconsistencies even with incorrect context information, especially since this setup is on purpose to indicate the potential attacks. One participant indicates that a screenshot looks like their PC's desktop, so this context may have been a false assurance that does not help the detection. User studies have inherent limitation in terms of uh, realism, representative, and scale. In our user study, the researcher provided credential might affect realism by providing inherent assurance. Also, our User study is conducted during the high propagation phase of COVID pandemic. Um, as a safety measure, we choose to conduct the study remotely through conferencing tools. Therefore, any interaction with the phone is also conducted remotely with the researcher showing the phone's screen while participant tells how to proceed. 
This mostly affect the study using the screenshot context as our participant indicates that it's difficult for them to see the screenshot through a shared screen. Finally, well, our participant pool was small and the undergraduate student major in CS um, result in bias. However, such a bias should have increased the the attack detection rate since students' technical background made them more sensitive in computing details, but majority of the participant does not notice the form-based authentication attack. This highlights real risk with the form-based authentication in practice. To summarize our findings, depending on adversary's capability, the symptoms associated with form-based authentication attack can be too subtle to raise suspicions. We recommend identity providers use code matching-based approval request to avoid unassociated approval. Finally, our user study suggests that additional contacts in the authentication request provide little help in detecting the attacks. Further studies is required to verify this. That's all for today's presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I will be happy to answer them.